Thank you for taking the time to watch this rebroadcast of an interview with Life's Journey founder, Chris Shea. For more information about Life's Journey, check out our website at www.lifesjourneyblog.com. We hope you enjoyed the interview. And what we were trying to do, Chris and I, is we're trying to meet several times a month, but March has kind of gotten away from us. <laughs> and yes. uh, we usually will meet twice a month. And this time in March, it's going to be just this one time. And we wanted to meet on a Sunday this time. And typically we've met on Thursdays. I don't know if this mm -hmm. is, does this tend to be a better day for you, Chris? On a Sunday? Really either way. Okay. Um, I know it worked this month, but how about for yourself? I Sunday might be a better time. And I was actually wondering if it's a better time for most people just because it's on a weekend and people a little more kicked back. And so mm -hmm. we might want to consider maybe doing them on Sundays. But um, as by way of just a short introduction, I'm Lisa DeLay and I have a blog and a podcast at sparkmymuse.com. And I release a new podcast twice a week, once on a Wednesday and once on a Friday. And I have a lot of interesting people coming up, especially during mm -hmm. Easter week. The last thing that came out was with Ray Hollenbach and it's on deeper grace and forgiveness. And there's some really neat stuff on there. So there's some free downloads for some spiritual exercises too. So you can check that out. And Chris, why don't you introduce yourself? And I'm Chris Shea. I'm a counselor and life coach, and I also blog and have a podcast, and the podcast is uh, on Finding Peace, and you could get that over on uh, iTunes and Stitcher and SoundCloud and all those uh, great places uh, where you could get it. Very good. So. Yeah. And so what we were going to try to do is talk a little bit about, since this is Palm Sunday, kind of kicks off Holy Week. And again, I am sort of new to the whole concept of liturgical, the liturgical calendar in general, just kind of coming into it into, in adulthood and didn't go to a church that handed out palms on Palm Sunday or anything like that. And uh, so it's actually kind of been intriguing for me as an adult to look at this week before Easter in a new and richer way about looking at the life of Christ more deeply during this week before Easter and kind of walking through the life of Christ in the final week in a different way. I mean, I think we still we still talked about it at church and there were messages toward that, but it was a little bit hurried up. Like on Resurrection Sunday, it would be like, and here's the last week of Jesus here. <laughs> they kind of crammed it in. And, um, and so and it was mostly focused on the resurrection, of course, on Easter, but I actually think that going through the whole week makes it more interesting and makes the story richer because you see the highs and lows. And, and you were talking about the emotional roller coaster of Holy Week, and maybe you can speak to um, why you wanted to focus on that and, and sort of what you were, what, what were some of your thoughts related to that? You know, I, I can't imagine going through a church that doesn't really celebrate the, the beauty of this week. Um, but, yeah, I, I grew up where this week was a very special week and is just loaded with, uh, you know, real life events. And, and that's one thing that I, I'm really trying to get across is when we look at uh, you know, these events and we look at things such as, uh, you know, today is Palm Sunday and we talk about Good Friday and about Easter. I think we've done it so long as a society and, and even just as individuals that we may celebrate it as family and as a holiday, but how much of this do we really celebrate in light of the events that happened? Because at least this is one part within scripture that we know historically happened. So we know historically uh, of the person of Jesus. We know historically of the apostles and all the followers and the events that happened in Jerusalem and, you know, this whole week. So for me, spiritually, it's just a, a great time to look at what are those emotions, what, what was really going on. 
in the hopes that if I can understand that better, then, you know, hopefully I can get into a deeper spiritual sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and with Palm Sunday, I know one of the things that I had learned in seminary and I hadn't known prior to that was that in the contrast to how the occupiers, the Romans and, and the suppressive government would have come in um, as conquerors, they would have come in with parades and with their conquering generals on a you know big stallion and with parade, you know, parading through as conquerors and kings and conquerors, they would have come in in a parade like fashion too. And they would have had palm branches come down as, as these people would have been trying to make nice with them. <laughs> and then Jesus comes as a king, but not on a donkey, on on the, you know, the baby donkey, the fool of a donkey, and is kind of the, the humble king coming in, very unassuming, showing like the opposite, the upside down kingdom, the different sort of kingdom uh, and a different sort of king. But yet the people are really misunderstanding and they're thinking, here's the guy who's going to overthrow our oppressors. Here, here's the guy who's going to, you know, shake things up and kick the Romans out. Right. And, you know, it's, it's a really interesting contrast of all these expectations and contrasts and, you know, G Jesus kind of weeping over Jerusalem too, and kind of, you know, the not getting it. It's just, it, there's such a, there's such a powerful story with, within that triumphal entry. Right. Well, and, and I think that, you know, you really, and a big part of that is that we tend to forget that historical context and without learning and understanding the political impact. And that's really what a lot of this week is about. We do have the spiritual aspect, of course, but we also have a very political aspect to this. And had it not been for the Roman occupation, had it not been for the politics with some of the leaders of the Jewish religion, um, this would have went very different. So oh, yeah. I think it is important that when people want to get into the spiritual life, learn a bit about history and about the culture. And when you really get into that, I think it only enhances what we've learned and can enhance the spiritual sense. Right, right. Because you, you can tell it's not just a story that we, we pull out and add to our lives. It's more rich when you understand what people are going through and you can step into the story and, and see it see it through their eyes and then see the significance. I think that's that's kind of why I've enjoyed watching films that have to do with not that they're always, you know, that they're not always accurate or anything, or like Jesus with blue eyes or something like that. Right. It's not, good, not really accurate at all. But but that you can kind of get a feel for even just Semitic culture and and uh, the religious leaders of the time and holding all this power and and uh, you know people who are hoping for a savior and then people who believe and there's all the non-believers and and people who follow Jesus and then stop following him. And you get to kind of see it from the confusing way it was, you know, mm -hmm. where you have, you have kind of a paparazzi thing going for, for Jesus because he's healing people. And so all these, and he's a storyteller. So all these people are following him for probably because he's feeding them. He's feeding them that mm -hmm. he's, you know, so there are people are like going for the stories and the food and the healings and he's getting mobbed. Mm -hmm. And then he has these followers that are following him for three years. There's just a lot of stuff there that um, sometimes we'll just cherry pick it and, and add it to our own spiritual lives for our own spiritual benefit. But we're not thinking about the historical sense. And that actually comes back in and enriches our lives mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. And yeah. to me, if, if we just kind of cherry pick the stories and, and we can say, well, those are nice spiritual stories and, you know, we know Jesus died for us and, you know, mm -hmm. all of that is great, but it really does enhance, you know, at, at least within my spiritual sense, what it's like um, when you can put yourself into the whole politics and the looking at what is real, you know, like you mentioned, you know, some of his followers might have been around just because he did feed them 
you know, there's a very practical sense. And we also have to keep in mind that at this time period, people running around claiming to be the Messiah was the norm. Yeah. So, you know, we kind of look at this and say, oh, Jesus comes and, you know, we know he's the Messiah. Why didn't they recognize him? Well, he wasn't the only one walking around saying, I'm the Messiah, you know, and so that lends something to the whole story, you know, that why does he get more uh, belief and, and credence than some of the other ones who are running around? And, you know, what what set him apart from the other ones? Right. And, and I don't think, yeah. we, you know, we recognize that enough to, to try to think what made him unique? Because right. that's why people started following him in, in those numbers where the other ones would not have gotten the numbers that he was getting. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and also he was, they wanted to kill him and they, they were going to let a lot of them, they let the other ones die out, but this one just kept gaining and gaining. They really needed to put a stop to it. They wanted to put a stop to it, but it didn't die out. Even after they started, they killed him. Then they killed his followers and it wouldn't die out. Mm-hmm. You know, it just wouldn't, die out right. you know, even after jerusalem is completely destroyed and everybody's running for their lives and fleeing for their lives and captured and taken away it only progresses you know even after all the you know it wasn't and and they're like oh well christianity was co-opted by the romans but that wasn't for over 300 years right so it doesn't die out after all that persecution and of course eventually it's co-opted by by uh, rome but people are just getting killed in tremendous numbers mm-hmm. following Christianity. It's definitely not the thing you want to do. It's not the safe bet. You know, no, you, you don't no. want to do that. But the, but the fact that the testimony of the disciples is, is so compelling and, and there's so many eyewitnesses uh, to the resurrection that it just takes hold in, in mm-hmm. such a major way. And it's such a revolutionary thing, not revolutionary that the Romans get, get kicked out, but right. revolutionary in a way that changes lives and people are cared for in completely new ways. It wasn't happening in in any other any other aspect in any other way. Mm-hmm. And so it, it kind of set that whole place in the world on fire in their hearts and just is kind of unstoppable. So I think nobody was anticipating that and not even the disciples. They weren't they weren't getting that oh, either. No. And you get the sense that they have they're completely clueless. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and I, I think that's the other piece that needs to be looked at is you know, looking at it over 2,000 years later, we jumped to this conclusion that the apostles, well, they were the apostles. They knew everything. I think we have to remember that the apostles still weren't 100% sure on who this guy was. I think they were getting that glimpse and, and you know, there's a lot of dialogue Jesus would have with them that we just don't have written down. But, right. you know, they weren't 100% convinced and I think that's one of the reasons they fled in fear that it wasn't just, you know, fear that the Romans would come after them, which would be a good fear. But I think part of it might have been their own uh, feelings of confusion and anger and maybe felt used because I'm mm-hmm. sure a bunch of them had now this doubt. Well, maybe he's not who we thought he is. Yeah. Yeah. And that must have been a whole bunch of emotion, you know, that I'm fearing for my life and I might have been duped, you know, and yeah. how do I live with that? Right. And of course, that's epitomized in Judas, Judas's betrayal. He was really hoping for something else and it really wasn't going to pan out like he hoped. Mm-hmm. So he's willing, he's willing to work, to work with the, the corrupt, you know, power brokers, the Jewish uh, religious leaders and like okay i'll turn him over I'll, I'll tell you where he's where he is i'll tell you where his hangout is at the, right you know mount of olives and um and so it's it's interesting because um you know as we think about this last week leading up to the crucifixion of jesus where there's the triumphal entry you know it got me because we're st- going to do this, then I read all the gospels and all the accounts, you know, so I was like, okay, I'm going to read. Okay, here we go. I'm going to research. I'm going to re- I'm going to read them all. And you know, how they're positioned is different in each one. 
and what's focused on is, is a little different. And then you have some of them where there's the triumphal entry and then some parables get thrown in there some, sometimes depending on which mm -hmm. one you're reading. And then you have um, the Last Supper and you have pretty pretty obvious and weird event of Jesus washing the disciples' feet, which, which is like Peter is super offended. You know, he's yeah. like, what are you doing? You know, it's really... Like, please don't do this. It's totally embarrassing because he's, you know, Jesus is doing this thing that's essentially really inappropriate. Like, uh, you know, like your teacher getting up and being your waiter for the evening, even even more humiliating than that, because he kind of right. strips down and he washes their feet in their really gross, you know, feet from walking in the dirt. <clears throat> and, you know, he doesn't want that to happen. It seems really embarrassing to be on the receiving end of that. But then Jesus is the whole time showing him how the kingdom of God works and how leadership works and this is kind of this big lesson that he's he's showing them by example and i think they're still thinking here's the guy who's going to be the king and you know james and john are still vying for like prime minister <laughs> and secretary of defense or something and their mom's in on it and like yeah and i think that they're still in their heads thinking this is how it works it works like you know an earthly kingdom and we're going to topple this situation, you know, topple the Romans. And and then Jesus gets down on his hands and he starts wiping the grime off of their feet. And it, it's just it's just not computing and just not really getting that something else is going on. Right. And I mean, why would they? Like, I wouldn't, I'm sure I wouldn't understand either. It's so strange. It's so different. Well, and that's the whole point. And, and I'm glad you bring that up because, you know, that's a lot of what I'm, you know, trying to get across to people is – you know, that kind of notion that put into the historical context, it begins to make a little more sense, you know, of Peter's reaction. You know, you, you kind of wonder, you know, I, I think reading it from a modern perspective, we, we kind of look at that from the opposite, you know, that, um, you know, Peter is kind of slapping Jesus in the face, you know, of, of not letting him, you know, do this. But we, you know, looking at it in context, yeah, it is the other way around. And, and Peter was reacting in a way you would expect somebody in, in his position and, and his background, uh, you know, would react. He, he was not out, out of bounds at all. Um, but that does show, you know, more so what Jesus was all about. And, and that's to be countercultural, you know, and, and that's to be ministry and, uh, you know, to make it real for people and, and for me, that, that's part of where, with Holy Week, when we look at all of these emotions and these stories, they need to lead somewhere. And, and what I hope and what I try to do is, you know, how do they lead me to living a better life? You know, what, what do I take from this? You know, putting myself in there, you know, and kind of looking at that, you know, Jesus is teaching Peter something very valuable and, and wants Peter to do this, you know, and even at the Last Supper when he says, do this in my memory, you know, he's really teaching something that he wants them to follow. And, uh, you know, they're, they're just not, as I said, not yet getting it. You know, they're kind of there, but they still don't understand it. Yeah. And um, I really appreciate John's gospel, too, that goes into a lot of detail about Gethsemane and the vine and the branches and mm -hmm. um, really explores that night in so much more detail than, than the other gospels. And it talks about um, the spirit being um, the comforter. And it, it really goes into a lot in John 14 through 16, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. And it really fills out that night. And I, I don't know if, if John took other things and, and put them into that night or if it actually all did happen on that night, but, but whatever, however, it, however it's put together, it gives you such a sense about what Jesus is trying to set up and, and trying to explain about his ways and, and mm -hmm. the way of love and the way of how the spirit works and about abiding, abiding in love and things like that, which is again, so radically different than what they're expecting. And, you know, leading up to his crucifixion, which I think is still kind of a surprise and mm -hmm. um, that leaves them all 
completely devastated, obviously. They're, you know, this is why, um, this is why that Good Friday and Saturday is such a downer. <laughs> it's such a downer yeah. in the liturgical year. Oh, definitely. Because it's, if you're going to step into the story and, and not just skip to the to Resurrection Sunday, which of course is beautiful and glorious and rebirth. And I mean, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's just triumph and glory and wonderful. And you want to get there. But if you're going to really step into the story, then you have to step into the darkness of it too, which is very, very dark yeah. and, and very heart wrenching. And if you're going to step into what it was like to be them, then it's mass confusion, chaos. Everybody's running in different directions. Everybody's afraid to get arrested. They're locking their doors and they're be obviously all, you know, betray Jesus in the sense that no one sticks around. Mm -hmm. um, and then all of a sudden he's crucified and then they're burying him. And it, and then they're, you know, resting for the Sabbath. They're not going in and, and putting spices on them or anything till they, till yeah. they try to on Sunday. But then, and then the women are the ones that go, the guys, I don't know if it's a, if it's a cultural thing that only women help with the dead bodies, but only the women show up to help mm -hmm. anyway. And then uh, I was really so struck by in Mark, at least if you don't read the, the endings that are tacked on, um, Mark is like, <laughs> Mark is so funny. Cause I, I've, I've heard that Mark is, is likely Peter's account written by John Mark. Right. And it's, it was, might've been Peter's like typical sermon that he would sort of say, you could sort of read Mark in 45 minutes. It might've been mm -hmm. sort of his routine, like mm -hmm. thing that he would say as he went from place to place. And, <clears throat> and, and it's just left like, and the women saw Jesus and no one believed them. <laughs> just sounds <laughs> like that. And you're like, what? Mm -hmm. and they doubted, they thought they were crazy. And what they said didn't make sense. And it sort of ends like that. And you feel like there's probably going to be a follow-up. And so then they do, of course, add a couple follow-ups and like, right. to tidy it up. But you could tell it's like a cliffhanger. <laughs> I feel like, uh -huh. <clears throat> and I was talking to my friend, um, Shane Blackshear, we had a little a blab conversation too. And it was kind of like, that is what you don't want to happen when you want a credible story. You don't, you don't want like, number one in that culture women define jesus resurrected which they're not even acceptable testimony in a court of law they're gonna their testimony is gonna be thrown out immediately in mm -hmm. that culture and you don't want people to not believe them and then stick that in the story right. you don't do in your story that you want everybody to believe you don't say uh oh, women found them okay we're gonna toss that out and then they're the followers of jesus didn't believe them mm -hmm. and they put that in there and it's just like probably because it happened just like that and it's just it's just so funny. So the doubt is is interspersed right in there the entire way, and yeah. and it just seems like that's probably how it would go down. You'd have you'd have mm -hmm. these people like they kind of they believe, then they don't, then they believe, then they don't. But, and it's just like, aren't we all just like that? We will be like yep. faithful, and then be like, yeah, but I don't understand. I don't get it. And then and then we kind of you know figure it out you're the son of God. And then we're kind of like, I don't get it. I don't understand. <laughs> and it's, it's just like, it gives me a lot of uh, comfort and peace of mind that the disciples seem as human as I am yeah. and as confused as I can be. <laughs> well, and, and, and that's, you know, again, trying to look at this in, in light of the history, because, you know, when we look at them from our time, yeah, we look at them as, you know, well, they were these great spiritual people and, you know, look at what they did and, you know, started this whole big movement. And, but yeah, we have to remember they weren't any different than you and I, and they had their ups and their downs and, and, you know, they would follow him in the good times. And when things got just a little bit icky, you know, it's like, well, maybe we'll walk away. And, uh, you know, so yeah, I mean, for me, that's like, well, I'm in good company, you know, and, uh, I do like the, the story you were just saying, because, you know, when people have asked me, well, how can you really be sure, you know, that any of this happened? Part of my response is what you were just saying. If we look at this historically, and if you look at the Gospels, these are stories that were written to convince people to join this new movement. You know, I mean, we read them now usually as convinced people in our churches but that wasn't the case. You know, the writers of these documents were writing them to convince people, you know, Jesus is the son of God. You got to, you know, come out and do this stuff. 
So you're right in what you're saying. I mean, how does a convincing document of the pinnacle of this, the pinnacle is the resurrection. Without the resurrection, he's just any other messianic figure who got killed. Mm -hmm. The pinnacle of your story, you throw in, as you say, the women who were considered nothing in that society are the ones who are given the message first that's most pinnacle. Right. And the followers who are now saying, hey, I'm a follower, join this church. But if you read my document, it says, hey, I didn't believe either. <laughs> I know. <laughs> that's not a promotional. <laughs> it's so not super. Like, it's funny because they're kind of like, yeah, I didn't believe either. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, you know, I didn't believe either. And I had to be convinced because it's pretty hard to believe. And I think that that's kind of like what we sometimes want to feel like is that our belief has to be completely bulletproof. Like someone right. said, oh, you, you're a doubter. You're a doubter. You don't believe hundred percent. And I'm like, yeah, sometimes I don't, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. because it does sound like a really wild story, but mm -hmm. look at the disciples, the apostles closest, best friends. Jesus was their number one guy, right. their teacher. They hung out with them for three years. They also weren't convinced. I'm okay. Right. I think I'm in good company. Like, I think, that, <laughs> I think it's okay to have doubts. If Peter, you know, Jesus says, gives him the keys to the kingdom. He's also like, eh, I don't know, you know, mm -hmm. and then sometimes he's okay. Sometimes he's not, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's kind of the human condition is that we're not, we're not a hundred percent certain on things. And I even would go as far as to say atheists aren't a hundred percent certain either. And that's why they attack people who are theists right? It's because it's hard to be a hundred percent certain about stuff, mm -hmm. whatever your beliefs are. And I think people who, who truly feel a hundred percent certain about whatever it is they believe in is a little bit self deception because yeah. it's really hard to, to not say that, to, to say that something is so mm -hmm. sure. I mean, even things like that we thought were hundred percent certain, like certain things in math are proving to be not a hundred percent certain. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's like, I don't feel bad anymore about saying I have my doubts or some things seem confusing or some things seem hard to believe sometimes mm -hmm. because that's just the truth. That's the honest truth. But there's there's things that, that really resonate with me in the story that really, really touch my heart and things that seem so, so true and things that I know that the example in the life of Jesus Christ and his message of love and restoration and grace and forgiveness if that's not true, then I kind of don't care if I'm wrong because right. that's just the way. <laughs> like right. that, that's just the. Way. And so if I if I die wrong about that, so <laughs> what? <laughs> right. I'm okay with it. But but you know, be, uh, believing different things 100 percent of the time with 100 percent certainty, I'm fine admitting that that's not my situation, yeah. and that you know, and well, it's sort of this, that happens sometimes, right? And and I, I don't think that um uh, Yes, I agree yeah. totally. Um yeah, thank you, uh Brandon, on that. Because yeah, and that was something similar I was gonna mention that you know, if you never question that belief, then do you really believe it? I mean, you know, right. when you look at the, the followers of, of Jesus, I mean if you were to look at from just a, a pure business sense, you know, so Jesus comes around and has like this program that he wants to get spread around, you know, Judea and Galilee and all that, you would pick the top notch people to be your spokespeople. Right. Doesn't. Right, right, right. By not any stretch like these, of <laughs> not these bumpkins from Jibet way out in the booth. Exactly. You know who are totally but, uneducated. Well, exactly, you know, and, and because I think he picks them because they're real in the sense that they're willing to question things, and Jesus doesn't want blind follow, you know, uh, followers. He, he mm. I, I think, as frustrating as he probably was much of the time with those guys, <laughs> yeah, I, I think what helped also was that the more they questioned and the more they sought answers, the deeper their faith became. And I think that's true, you know, and, and when you read a lot of uh, the saints and, you know, uh, a lot of writings now we're hearing from Mother Teresa and, you know, the, these dark nights that people have spiritually or questions that people have. And, but you come out on the other side 
hopefully with a deeper faith because you've sought the answer. You didn't just hear what somebody said and went, okay, that's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you sought it, but then you found something that resonated within you. And I think that's, you know, going back with this whole Holy Week and the emotions, you know, what makes this important is do these emotions resonate with us? And is that what helps us to deepen the faith, you know, to know that, you know, let's say like if I were there, I would probably do what the apostles did, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and, and to think, well, that's okay. Because, you know, when you think back in your life, there are times that we've, you know, doubted and, and maybe denied him and, uh, you know, questioned who he really is. You know, but in the end, do we come out on, on the other side saying, yeah, th th this is right. And uh, th that's why I think, you know, by the Gospels being real with the women are finding it and the guys are doubting it. They're not just being humble. I, I would say the reason that that is there is like you're saying, it's because it's true. Because... Yeah. If they sat around and thinking, well, we're going to make up that he rose from the dead. Well, yeah, you're not going to make it up by having the women find them and we deny it. That, that's not how you're going to make that story up. <laughs> right. Well, what's, what's really fascinating, too, what I heard is that when Paul talks about it, he actually whitewashes over that part as he's like quickly recounting the gospel. And because he's trying to get a better argument like he's sort of like, he doesn't mention it even at all because it's not helpful to his argument. So he's right. not going to really mention it because it's, he's not trying to create an argument mm -hmm. that that's just like, here are the facts. He's just trying to say, here's, here's the best argument I can present. So he doesn't include it in there. Yeah. And it's because it's doesn't behoove him to include that because it's so shaky when you put that in. Mm -hmm. for that time oh yeah. Period. Because yeah, so, most of the people would look at that and say, well, this is just ridiculous. Like, why would, why would that be a good idea to like, uh, exactly. obviously you have a shaky story here. But it's, yeah. it's Although yeah. you could also then look at that other side and say, well, this must be true because right. they're not putting themselves in a good light here. Yeah, it's not a, pro a propaganda piece. You're going to want, like, you're going to want something yeah. way different. And yeah, I, mean, I can see a PR person looking at that manuscript going, oh, no. <laughs> We're going to be to this line. Yeah. And it's, and it's interesting too, that Jesus decides to, um, you know, these are women who, who cared for Jesus, who made a meal. So really were close with him and that Jesus would develop a relationship with these women because he didn't treat them like the men of the time treated them, which was second class or, whatever in in disrespectful ways or that he was treating them as you're you're just you know i'm happy to speak with you first he, he's right. not going to say hang on ladies i you know i'm going to not even bother seeing you because men are more important i'm going to show myself to them first he happens to see them first and so i think that it it um it just shows that there isn't a favoritism there and that right. Jesus saw them first and saw them first. So um, it's, it's kind of, um, there's something, there's something really beautiful about that. And I think that um, it's just the way of Jesus is very different. When we, when we impose our cultural thing on there, we're going to get it wrong. The way of Jesus is never really like the culture, unless the culture happens to be like Jesus. But, <laughs> but um, Jesus doesn't have the ways. I mean, that's why he he's always getting criticized for eating with the wrong people and yeah. and um, you know associating with people who are very unloved and on the margins, and and despised by the rest. And you know, too poor, too uh, sleeping around too much, or you know, swindling somebody here or there. Mm -hmm part of essentially the mafia of his time and he's like if you want to eat with me i'll eat with you and that's a pretty intimate thing in the middle east yeah. you're dipping your food into the same food bowl mm -hmm. it's not like now where we have you know silverware they they dipped in right. with the same food and they were touching hands and it's mm -hmm. you know you could catch a cold you, you could catch a cold <laughs> eating with people this way or catch whatever they had maybe and i think that it's that's why you didn't associate with people you weren't supposed to associate with. And so, right. and the Jews had so many very formal things about who's, who's clean, who's unclean. And, and so 
really he he was violating social norms he was re violating religious norms and so he was getting gossiped and <laughs> and maligned mm -hmm. from from all over the place but he didn't care because he truly was um just that gracious and i think that that's kind of what he's trying to set up in, yep. in this it, with this idea with his followers is like i'm it's different now I'm doing, mm -hmm. things are different now and, and it'd be hard for them who you know were probably close to middle age most of the followers most of the 12 you know to change their ways so to follow somebody like this you know they put themselves out and took a big risk and um you know to make those changes that they ended up making i i think this whole holy week is what really prompted that you know because prior to this they sure they had doubts and, and they had some emotions here and there but you didn't have this this roller coaster of you know triumphal entry to he's hanging on a cross and we're fearing for our lives and wondering who this guy really is and, and did he dupe us all? Yeah. You know, that's a huge range of emotion. Yeah. You know, plus knowing that somebody you've been close to is the one who betrayed him. You know, so it's mm -hmm. like, can we trust anybody else? You know, who else yeah. is going to do something stupid? Yeah. You know, and if we're yeah. hiding from the Romans now, who else is going to give us up sitting up in this room? You know, so who do we trust? Who don't we trust? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think again that spiritual sense of going through that darkness that come on that other side you know to really more deeply understand what this was all about and and it helped to give them the strength uh to carry on that ministry and do what was needed but they had to fall a number of times and they had a question and and they had to be fearful um i, I can't even imagine all the emotions they were going through uh you know for themselves yeah. Yeah. And, it, and what do you think about, maybe you can talk a little bit about what you think about the Garden of Gethsemane scene and, <clears throat> excuse me, and what Jesus is going through there. Of course, the disciples are like exhausted, <laughs> they pass out. Another, another display of like, does not put them in a good light either. Doesn't no. put them in, not put them in a, like if they're trying to make themselves look good, Mm, yeah, that that, yeah. that would be not the way to tell the story. That would be no. the and we stood there guarding Jesus, pretty pretty buff. You know, we had just been looking mm -hmm. out and we had swords. Like you would definitely not tell the story like that. That would be the story. No. That's a story that makes you look like a total lazy jerk. And <laughs> and, and again, a story that I would figure is real. That really happened. <laughs> that probably really because happened. if you're gonna make something up, you're not gonna make that up and throw that in there no. and think that helps you, no, <laughs> you know, it, totally, um, it doesn't like, help leave, you at all. Stay awake. And they're like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that whole, you know, garden scene and, and that whole night, uh, unfortunately, none of the gospels that we have really, I think, go to the depth of that story. You know, we're missing so much from that story. Yeah, sure. We have the important snippets. pieces. Yeah, and we have the important parts, and and sure we can go on and spiritualize the whole thing. You know, when are we asleep? You know, when when you know we're needed to do what we need to do, and yeah, I mean, we could do all that. But really, what I focus on is what Jesus was going through, because you know what little bit we have now. Sure, it, it seems so. You know. Like, hey, Jesus saying, well, you know, I'd rather not do this. And if this is the only way, then, hey, great, then I guess I'll do it. Um, to me, that didn't take all night. And he was there all night because they were sleeping. Mm -hmm, right. There had to have been so much more of that internal pain and agony mm -hmm. that we don't know of. And mm -hmm. to me that's something that strikes because if somebody were to say, well, Jesus doesn't understand us, he's God. Okay. Yes, he's God. But I think he understands your pain and suffering because he spent that whole night 
probably going through those stages of death and dying right there. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and, and, and you got to know there's that part of him that, I mean, he's God, he knows that, but that human side, you know, is struggling with how best do I minister? And, you know, I want to do the right thing, but, you know, I, I think just like anybody else, knowing your death is coming, I, I don't see him acting in, in any other way. And, and what gets me is you can spend that whole night in this agony and this bargaining and all of what he was going through to then finish that night and say, well, yeah, your, your will be done. Uh, I'm just going to do what, what you want to be God, you know, and, and that speaks volumes to me in, in that sense that, you know, how much do we need to that no matter how much suffering we go through and how much pain we're in, at what point do we just say, yeah, it's real, it's painful, but yeah, your will be done. And, and I've, I've got to trust this is going to work. And yeah. that's what he did. He went in, in complete trust. It was like, I'm, I'm just going to trust this is going to work. Yeah. And I think that the, the um, we, we tend to a little bit, I mean, it's, it's obviously it's a mystery about the hundred percent God, hundred percent man thing. Right. I, I can't say that I get it. <laughs> it's another thing where I'm like, yeah, I don't yeah, know. We, I, I we can't get that. <laughs> I understand the theology and the duality. I mean, a, like yeah. in a sense, how does it play out? I can't say, you know, no. there's smarter people out there than me that I guess maybe could understand well, that, but not me. But, anyway. but I think it's more important to understand it emotionally than the intellectual side. And, yeah. Well, the yeah. psychology of the whole like stages of grief thing is really kind of interesting thing that <clears throat> you know that probably all those stages of grief happened mm -hmm. during this experience, you know, the bargaining and the all of the stuff that happens when you're, when you know, you're going to go through something kind of horrible for anybody who's actually gone through something horrible, like the death of a loved one or the prolonged illness and death or something where, you know, Oh no, I'm going to have to go through this. And God, please don't let this happen. Like you start, you start, well, there's first of what shock, right? Shock mm -hmm. denial. And you're kind yeah, of like anger. Ah, anger, yeah, bargaining. <laughs> yeah. And, and there's, there's a whole bunch that goes through your head. And I think that, it's really easy for us to go, well, you know, he's on a mission from God and, and he's God right. too. So it's kind of not a huge deal. And I think it's actually that maybe we're thinking about the God side of Jesus as something like, oh, instead of thinking mm -hmm. like, it's really, really overdoing the God part. I don't want to get too deep and too theological and, <laughs> you know, get hate mail or something, but I'm not saying that Jesus isn't God. All I'm saying is that, I think we really diminish the human side. Right. If if it's not important that Jesus isn't a hundred percent human, then he didn't need to come here at all. Right. Like we could have just had something else happen. Like yeah. it, it's the, it's important that Jesus was in every way human. Exactly. And if that's not important, it could just something else could have happened. The our incarnation is super super important because it helps us figure mm -hmm. out life <laughs> right. and figure well, out and that's why I'm not, yeah and that's why i'm not as concerned as do i understand the 100 percent god 100 percent human no because i don't but yeah you're right because he was 100 percent human in that garden yeah, yeah. and and again if, if that wasn't important the apostles would have never written that in the gospels if that whole garden scene, except for the betrayal and arrest, if that other piece weren't important, it wouldn't be there. And even though they slept, they knew enough that he was going through some real deep emotional pain and agony. And yeah, we, we do, you know, sweep that under, I think, way too much. And that diminishes for me the importance of the Good Friday and the later resurrection. You know, because if we just make it, well, he was always God at all times. So, you know, he knew that was going to happen. He knew he was going to rise. No biggie. Well, then that, for me, what it, where does that leave me? Because I'm not God. You know, so now that the story has no importance to me because, well, I'm not God and he is God and I'm suffering and I don't know how it's going to end, but he did. So, eh. you know, but for me to know that there's that part of him that seriously did not know how this was going to end. <laughs> and that's why he was bargaining. 
you know, if he 100% knew of the resurrection, you know, those, those three days later, why would he be bargaining with God? Hmm. Yeah, that's, it, it's tricky because I don't, I mean, I've heard it said so many different ways. I, I don't, I don't know exactly, exactly what you're saying yeah. is so hard to figure that out. Wouldn't you be like, hey, no biggie. It's going to be like, I'm fine with it. But the torment of knowing you're going to be uh, beaten until you're unrecognizable as a human being mm -hmm. and be separated from God and completely abandoned and alone, naked outside a city gate with your mom there. It's just the whole thing is just so horrible to imagine yeah. and to know that that's your fate and it's going to be horrible for the next however many hours. Mm -hmm. It's it's pretty horrible and gruesome and you know the trajectory. I think, you know, he knew the trajectory yeah. where it's going. And I think some people, of course, would say, no, no, he knew everything. He knew every single last minute detail. And I would actually, you know, be on the side of that he's he his experience was a lot more human than we tend to think it was yeah. you know that's the side i would go on and i know people are going to be like no no the second he was born he knew every single thing that would happen to him for the rest of his life um i'm much more on the side of that his experience was really really similar to ours but he didn't have sin <laughs> and right. that kind of thing and and so that his emotions were genuine completely real mm -hmm. when he cried he was really crying he wasn't like yeah. i'm god but now i'm going to pretend to cry you know um, right. i think i think well, that well, that's the thing you know are, do we worship and follow the greatest actor in the world or right. are we following the messiah <laughs> you know right because somebody not, yeah somebody we can follow because he's an example or someone we could follow right. because he's he's a like a deity faking faking being a human right you know you know, and, and he wasn't, and, and that's why those hundred percents mean something to me, even though I can't explain it. <laughs> right, right, right. right. Yeah. Um, if he truly knew a hundred percent and felt a hundred percent that that resurrection was coming no matter what, why would he yell out it from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mm -hmm. You know, he felt abandoned. And again, that's not a good PR phrase to put in your gospel stories. <laughs> right. You know, if you're trying to convince people that the person on that cross is God, and yet you say to people, and yeah, well, he did think that God forsook him, but it, but he's God still, so you know, it's okay. <laughs> so again, yeah. that that tells me it was really said, and and like you say, he wasn't acting. This isn't like, well, maybe this phrase will sound good at this point, you know. <laughs> right. I, I think there was that that you know that human side that we have to remember really felt abandoned. Yeah. And, you know, what he learns later, of course, with the resurrection and, you know, the, the fullness of God and all, but, you know, to me, making, emphasizing the humanness actually gets me into a deeper spiritual sense because then I know that the reason my God came to this world was, to be intimately involved with us and in order for him to do that he became one of us and to me that actually gives me a greater belief than if i overemphasize the deity of jesus where then it'd be like well then none of that meant anything mm -hmm. yeah i see what you mean too i i think it's a it's a much more profound thing to think that jesus experience could be my experience that I can live the life of Jesus <clears throat> that I can follow when when he says follow me he's mm -hmm. not like come follow me to heaven because I did something good for you it's more like do what I did D do, right. do this get do this life you know live this mm -hmm. life and and it's going to have an eternal reward too <laughs> but this is the life I'm calling you to not this is your fire insurance policy so you can come to streets of gold one day. You know, I think that the whole thing is that, that it's a way to be in the world yeah. and that this well, kingdom come is now. Yeah. And, and when he says, follow me, it does mean follow me in what I'm doing and follow me to the depths of despair of the cross. And then you will follow me to the joys of the resurrection. Yeah, new life. And, and I think we forget that piece that, yes, yeah, the follow me, so I'm going to do all the good stuff and I'll go to church and I'll believe in God. And then I get the resurrection. You know, but the follow me includes the betrayals, 
the bargaining, the feeling alone, you know, the despair, you know, why have you forsaken me, God? Right. That's part of the follow me. Yeah, and you don't get the resurrection without that piece of the follow me. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's what, what you're saying is such an important point that following Jesus, I think there's been a, and I'm not sure, I'm not Catholicism is a lot better equated with the, the suffering of Christ than evangelicalism. Mm -hmm. Evangelicalism is like, you're going to climb Sunshine Mountain. Everything's going to be happy. And here's your mm -hmm. pill. Here's your Jesus pill. And it doesn't associate with the suffering of Christ like Catholicism does in a rich way. And I wish those two things would come together. And I, I don't mm -hmm. know, because there's a lot of importance in identifying with the suffering of Christ, that that is a good thing. I'm not staying there all the time constantly, no. <laughs> but, no. but the idea is that there's nothing wrong with identity when you suffer to say, you know what, Christ suffered too. And so I'm, it's going to be okay. Christ suffered too. Mm -hmm. If this happens to make me more like Christ and by God's grace, it will, right. then I'm better off. But that. Well, and, and if you, and if you can look at that in the sense of, can that in some way bring meaning to my suffering? Right. Yeah. You no. Know, yeah. Can I in some way, whatever I may be suffering with, if I can bring that to prayer, if I can, you know, ask God to maybe relieve somebody else's suffering and, you know, continue mine, if, if that's, you know, God's will, or, you know, can I pray my way, even though I'm suffering? And maybe that's an example to somebody who's noticing mm -hmm. what I'm doing and that inspires them to do something in their life. You know, in my mind, it's, you know, if, if not that we emphasize that suffering of Jesus, but you don't eliminate that suffering because he did suffer for all of us. So could our suffering also help somebody else? Right. And and from our suffering, we have this depth of empathy that we didn't have before. I was just talking to somebody who um, we, hadn't, we haven't seen him in a while, family friend. And, and so we're, I said, you know, I'm really having a struggle with, with migraines and it wasn't unlike I have ever had before. <clears throat> and he started saying about 15 years ago, I had a terrible time. Thank goodness. I don't have that problem anymore. And, but he would, he could totally get it. He's like, I hate when people say yeah. they have headaches or they say they have a <laughs> migraine. It's a headache. It's just a headache. Right. I said, no, you'll know a migraine when you can't get out of bed. And, and, you know, so we were like, we got, he got it. He has suffered right. terribly. So he knew what I was talking about when you can't get out of bed and you're, and you're, <laughs> you're like this, that's a migraine when you can't function. Right. Mm -hmm. and so he, he got it, you know, and, and it's exactly. because he suffered, it wasn't good, but he could really get it. And he could really mm -hmm. say, that stinks. I totally know what you're going through. Well, the next yeah. day he got a migraine. I couldn't help but oh, think, no. I couldn't help but think the poor guy empathized so much that out of his sympathy, his brain remembered what it was like and gave him what I don't know what happened. I, I hope I didn't, I hope it wasn't somehow contagious, but, but the whole thing is, <laughs> is that that gives us a well to draw from to step into other people's lives and say, I'm right. with you. You're not alone. I I'm here mm -hmm. with you. And I understand because I've suffered and we can suffer alongside each other. You know, that's, that's right. the meaning of the word compassion. And so, and, and even, you know, when we pray in, in that suffering way and, you know, that we can e even raise that prayer up to, you know, either that, why are you forsaking me and where are you type prayer and, and also that prayer of, you know, you understand what I'm going through. Can you do something? Mm -hmm. You know, because we do need to look at that, that Jesus does understand it. He does get it because he went through it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, we're not just praying to, you know, the almighty God that it's like, well, the almighty God, of course, doesn't understand because, well, it's an almighty God. I mean, almighty gods don't get it. <laughs> well, no, the almighty God became one of us and got it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And Jesus you know, understands and, what it's like to suffer. I think that's extremely important to think, to, to think that that is the, the example has suffered. You know, that our example and the one we worship has suffered. And the, mm -hmm. that is a really kind of a huge deal. <laughs> I guess uh, yeah. that's an understatement, but. <laughs> well, you know, and what, what I've uh, mentioned, you know, to uh, usually to our, our students, especially in the high school and, you know, a lot of their questioning and, you know, they'll say, well, you know, there were a lot of gods back then, you know, and all cultures believed in multitudes of gods and look at Greek mythology and Roman mythology. And 
But as I point out to them, and I'm no expert in this, so if anybody's listening can <laughs> tell me otherwise, but I don't know of any of the major mythologies or other religions that have as their almighty God figure to become one of them and to suffer and go through what God has done. Hmm. And to me, that makes the big difference because if you want to say it, that all of this is one big myth among all the other godly myths, hmm. why is there only one which is so different from all the others? Mm. and all the others have faded away into our mythology books mm. you know and, and this one persists uh, over generations and nations and cultures um, it, it's just so different that we actually have a God who wants to be with us so well we have we have some perhaps yes so you can read that so that it actually comes on the if you can, if you can pronounce that, <laughs> so it's actually. I, can, I get some of it. So we do have, and I don't know their name, but thank you for sharing this. Uh, says Ethiopians imagine their gods as black and snub-nosed, Thracians blue-eyed, red-haired, but if horses or lions had hands or could draw and fashion works as men do, horses would draw the gods shaped like horses, lions like lions, make the gods resemble themselves. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I think there's, you know, some uh, key in that. And I forget who, I recently read somewhere a, a philosopher had said that, and I don't want to say it was C.S. Lewis because I might be wrong, but it said, did God make us in his image or if we made God in ours? Yeah, it's almost like, um, you know, the Bible says that God made us in our, in his image, but we kind of try to return the favor all the time, don't we? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and um, I, I've, I've always um, thought it was really interesting. Of course, you, you see in Western art, you see God always depicted as like a white bearded man in the sky and you, you know, see Jesus is blue eyed and everything. And I've always thought that oh, that's so offensive. But honestly, I, I came across a very old, about 300 year old picture of an Asian um, nativity scene with Asian Jesus, Asian mm -hmm. Mary and Joseph. And I was like, oh, look it's expressed in their culture and i thought it was wonderful and i didn't think hey jesus wasn't asian it's so obvious i i just didn't think that and it mm -hmm. was funny because i was like people will adjust it to fit their culture and i saw some right. I, I think it was actually ethiopian um christian art that was the same sort of way or cameroon cameroonian and i actually was found it incredibly endearing to see nativity scenes with you know, Cameroonian people, and, mm -hmm. and it's I found it offensive when I saw white ones because it seems so dominant. But I, right. um, but I think that that is the tendency for humans to to personify mm -hmm. God in their image. Oh, definitely. No matter what culture you're from, I think it's just people's natural tendency to to be mm -hmm. tribal and say, "You're one of you're one of us. You're one of me," and that that's kind of going to be the natural tendency. Uh, right. for all of us to, to try to do that and so you know it's it's part of the part of the human right. part of the human right. thing i guess and and, and I, I would agree you know with, with this person in, in that sense and what you're saying you know we, we always image god as, as we are and, and it's very difficult for us to image any different yeah uh you know and the abstract god you know what is that you know yeah. it's very right. hard for us and that's why we always look at you know god the father you know it's the masculine culture has kind of taken that over, but right. because we have to image in, in a, a tangible manner, not just this abstract sense. But I still think to the point of, you know, with the mythologies, all these other cultures could image their gods like them, but how many of their gods became them right. in those stories, you know, and, and lived as them and, and I think that's, you know, where a lot of the difference is, you know, you may have some of the gods who came down and bore children with humans and then you had half gods and, you know, yeah. the, these other deities. Yeah. But, you right. know, the, the story is very different, you know, in, in right. the Christian so belief. Condescension down into a, a different form for the sake of those people is a right. different kind of a, a story. And yeah, uh, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I, I actually think that the only thing that that I've heard that's like that is the Native Americans, but certain Native American groups, when missionaries came over, they're like, yeah, we know, we know that 
we know that story. And they're like, what? And then they would just describe the story that said that we've been worshiped the great spirit, had a son, uh, came down. And, and they actually <clears throat> had the same story. <laughs> and, and they're like, okay. So they're like, yeah, that, we already know that one. It was like it was somehow it worked in. I'm not sure what through what influence or divine revelation or what it was, but mm -hmm. um, it was just the same story. And so right. it, it wasn't easy for certain certain tribes with that same story to just say, yeah, you know, sure, we we already believe that. And so you're calling him Jesus, mm -hmm. so we'll just we won't call him Great Spirit's son. We'll just call him Jesus too. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sometimes it does happen, I think. But um, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm sure somewhere. And like you say, you know, it is you know, it's interesting, and, and that could get into a lot of uh, Jung and Carl Sagan are all in the sense of the, the collective unconscious, and you look at symbolism throughout the generations and yeah. cultures, you know, that are the same, yeah. you know, and, and that is there just something that we all know and sense, and, and how much of that is divinely inspired, and we just don't look at it as that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and people who are really paying attention to nature and, and the world can see see those same things around the world if they're really kind of tuning in they can kind of pick up on that because Paul says right says something to that effect about that that no one's without excuse because of creation and being able to see a, that witness in creation itself mm -hmm. from God and I can tell that I'm running out of battery power so I'm probably gonna have oh, to no. go We're, I'm at ten percent <laughs> but um, yeah and it's nine oh three but I think we hit on a really great topic with so much, so much uh, juicy discussion topics we could probably flesh out, but mm -hmm. um, probably could draw it to a close. Is there anything you'd like to close with, Chris, or anything else? Uh, I would just, you know, want like to encourage people to, you know, spend some time this week and, uh, you know, within their, you know, religious culture to really delve into the emotions and, and the history of this and maybe look at, you know, this whole experience of this week from a perspective they've never seen before and, you know, try it out and see what that does for them spiritually. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say too, um, definitely check out what Chris has on his stuff. Go to his website. It's, he posted it there and check out what I have too. It's work my muse and, mm -hmm. and try to, if you're not from a Christian tradition, or even if you are try to read at least one of the gospels from the triumphal entry on this week, try that for your homework or something. Right. And cause that's what I did. And I was like, Oh yeah, that's right. That happened. And, and you just kind of get refreshed. Maybe try to do that mm -hmm. and, um, and see, see if it hits you in a different way. See it from the humanity side um, and try to step into the story. And if you're the kind of person who prays and you're a Christian and that is meaningful to you, step into the story. And when something strikes you, uh, just pray about that, that one thing that strikes mm -hmm. you and, and see where that takes you. And, and I hope and I wish everybody a, a blessed Holy Week and a very um, glorious Resurrection Sunday. Yes, as do I to everybody and have a, a really blessed week and great Easter and saying to you, Lisa, and I hope it's a very spiritual and, and family event for all of you. Thank you so much. Yeah. And thanks so much for everybody who joined up. Let's see some, we got a few late comers, but um, we're, Chris and I like to do this two or three times. Well, I think it's mostly two times a month. So mm -hmm. follow us on Twitter and you'll see some access links to the next time we meet up, which will be in April. Maybe we'll, we'll keep you posted. And if you go to our website, of course, you'll, We'll see some updates for that. We usually right. will post a replay. If you've come late and you want to see the whole thing, there'll be a replay posted. You, you post them too, right, Chris? Right. I, I post them on uh, uh, my podcast site uh, on Finding Peace. Yeah, and um, I think they can find it on Blab too. Oh, yeah, that's right. Of course. Yeah, Blab mm -hmm. has these replays. So thank you so much, everybody. And we're, we're appreciative that you spent some time with us when you could have been could have been doing anything. I mean, there's, it's a big world out there. You could have been doing anything, but you spent it with mm -hmm. us. And it's really a blessing to have you along. So, all right. Well, thank you, Lisa. And blessings to everyone. Good night, everybody. Bye. Uh,